So, um, yes, so this restrict, what do we mean by restricted and repetitive behaviors? This is part of the diagnostic criteria for autism. You have to have greater um, than two of the following stereotyped or repetitive motor movements or use of objects or speech, insistence on sameness, inflexibility in routines, ritualized patterns of behavior, highly restricted or fixated interests, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interests in sensory aspects of the environment. So that's what we mean when we're talking about restricted and repetitive behaviors. And like uh, we were talking about, all behaviors exist on a continuum. And at some point we draw an arbitrary line and say we, we call it one thing and not another, but um, these are behaviors that exist in nature to varying degrees and in autism to varying degrees also. So sometimes we make this distinction between lower order and higher order repetitive behaviors where we think of lower orders as being purposeless movements or, or stimming, um, simple motor stereotypy or verbal stereotypy, stimming. You might include t motor and vocal tics as part of this, but again, how do you separate that from tics is a, is a big issue. In the middle somewhere, we have these complex but purposeless movements that you'll sometimes see, kind of patterns of behavior up towards higher order repetitive behaviors that actually are fairly complicated and might look more similar to OCD at some point. Let me see all of that in autism. Um, I put this in here because not all repetitive behavior needs to be treated or is a problem. So, you know, sometimes it's a behavior that irritates the family or is, is annoying or, or difficult to be around, but not necessarily a problem to a child, may not be causing distress. Um, so, you know, I try to talk up to families about this, that it's not necessarily something that we have to target. And when should we target or try to treat it? So if, it, if it's causing the child some distress. So I, we've probably all seen kids who get stuck in these loops where they're doing the same behavior over and over and they seem uncomfortable, they seem anxious, they can't stop, they want to stop, it's, or they're hurting themselves and seem to want to stop. Um, is it interfering with other things that they need to be doing? So is, is there a child who is so focused on um, flapping or um, fiddling with a, you know, a string that they're not able to do any academic work? Um, is it something that's disruptive to their sleep or interfering, um, causing them health problems? So kids who are uh, repetitively picking at their skin can get <coughs> secondary infections, and that might be something that we want to try to treat. And how disruptive is it to family life? Okay, so we are treating our, our whole family here. Sometimes I find they can actually be very useful. So these are highly motivating for a lot of kids. Sometimes you can actually use that um, interest, particularly these sort of novel or restricted interests as a reward for doing other non-preferred things. So it can be part of a, a first then task pairing where it might be first you do five math problems, then you get your break with your, your string to shake. So you can actually use it as a motivational tool I find for a lot of kids, these really unique interests can lead to important friendships. So kids who love Minecraft or uh, World War II um, tanks can find a little community of other kids who like the same things, and that's often very protective and leads to friendships. Um, some kids, you might say, if they can nurture this interest long enough and get through school, then this could be a very uh, helpful thing to them in picking a career. So especially kids who love computers or um, love numbers, there's often uh, good career paths that allow them to work independently and work with their interests if they can just make it through. Um, we do not have a lot of recommendations here. Last time we came up with a level zero and a level one. Our level one is around education. It's around trying non-medication uh, interventions first, things like cognitive behavior therapy or ABA and treating any comorbidities associated with them. All right, so um, level zero. Um, what we want to do is, is try to set the child up for success as much as we can by modifying the environment around them. So 
Um, what I find is that a lot of kids are less repetitive when they've got very clear expectations and they've got structured activity. So um, in this, I find particularly there's a, a gap. I don't know how it is in Florida, but when kids graduate from high school when they're 18 to 22, and there's not a lot of good structured daytime programming for young adults. I often see this spike in repetitive behaviors um, because there's a, a sort of a void and an absence of, of other things for this young adult to do. So providing a lot of structure can be very helpful. Simple distraction and redirection when possible. So just you know, having adults around them um, provide other activities, uh, you know, give them a simple verbal prompt when they notice the behavior can be very helpful. Using those interests as a reward for other expected behaviors. I find a lot of kids just need time to do these things and you want to help them develop the self-control to do it at times that aren't disruptive or going to be socially off-putting. So a lot of teens with uh, ASD develop ways to um, delay doing these things until they're home and then they might come home and unwind in their room by spinning or dancing or flapping and I usually tell parents just let them let them do it that's that's not a problem it's not interfering with anything or they'll find ways to hide it like putting their hands in their pocket if they need to rub their fingers together so there are some some strategies we can use to make them less um, socially obvious and and to allow them the movement that they need to, to meet that need. Um, sometimes it's helpful to coach parents in setting limits um, when behaviors become more problematic. So one I hear a lot about is repetitive question asking. They ask the same question, they want the same response every time, and they, and they kind of keep on and keep on, and for parents that's, that's really interfering. And so we can help parents set limits like you can ask four questions in 20 minutes and use timers and get very granular about how many questions they're allowed to ask. Um, giving sensory outlets, so fidgets, things like massage, heavy work, trampoline swings. All of these are, are not necessarily evidence-based strategies, but things that we do clinically. Okay. Um, there is not a lot of evidence for treating repetitive behaviors in autism. Um, a lot of attention has been given to SSRIs because of the sometimes similarity between OCD and um, some of the behaviors in autism. So we know that some of these things are pretty effective for OCD. So theory, we, they've, the thought was they might be helpful for autism too. Um, there's a meta-analysis done in 2012 looking at all of the, the RCTs for SSRIs. Um, they, there was a, what looked to be an evidence of publication bias, so there was a couple large studies that were never published, and when they included those in their analysis, they didn't find a significant effect. This is the forest plot from that study. So um, the largest one there was that King trial. That was the Citalopram study. So you'll see it was given 44% weight there, and that's that big square um, that looks like it's sort of sitting around zero. And that was also the study that found that um, about 20 to 25% of kids in the Citalopram group also had behavioral side effects. And it looked mostly like what we consider behavior activation, so they were more hyperactive, um, irritable, and had more difficulty sleeping. There have been a few smaller studies that look like they favor SSRIs, so there's that data. Um, it was a 12-week study, 150 kids. Um, they were mostly looking at global improvement, and then their secondary outcome was the, the Cybox, with that obsessive brown, um, Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale. Um, and so they, you know, they, the rates compared to placebo are pretty comparable, 32.9% versus 34%. All right. Um, fluoxetine is the one that has more mixed data for it. So that SOFIA trial is the one that I was talking about that was unpublished. Um, it was 158 kids, which is the largest study that we've seen in um, autism, 19 different sites. They were looking at low-dose fluoxetine versus placebo. In that study, it looked like it was pretty well tolerated at a low dose, but it did not really separate out from placebo. 
Um, the Hollander, the two Hollander studies are the ones that look more positive. They're a little bit smaller, so an N of 45 and an N of 37, and um, they did see um, improvement compared to placebo. Um, fluvoxamine, this is what we were talking about before, where there's some differential effects observed in kids versus adults. And again, this is all um, low numbers, right? So we've got two studies, one with an N of 30, one with an N of 34. That first study by McDougall is a 12-week study, um, and that was, um, that was in adults, okay? So 30 adults, they found about a 53% response rate. Um, they they're, weren't necessarily um, looking at one specific outcome measure, but they reported improvements in repetitive thoughts and behaviors, maladaptive behaviors, and social relatedness. It was pretty well tolerated in that adult group. So then they did a similar study in 34 children, same design, and they found only one of the 18 kids po responded positively to fluvoxamine, and they saw higher rates of agitation, aggression, hyperactivity, insomnia. I don't know that that's necessarily different than what you might have seen on a larger scale with something like citalopram, but on that small scale, that was their predominant finding, was that there was this, seemed to be this differential effect based on, on age. Uh, just coming back to BUSPAR one more time because this was a fairly large RCT and it went for 24 weeks and these were young kids. So they were looking at two to six year old kids, about 166 children. Um, they randomized to either 2.5 BID, uh, 5 BID or placebo and they were primarily looking at the ADOS which is that meant to be a diagnostic tool for autism but has been looked at more recently as an outcome measure. Um, they did have some secondary outcomes pertaining to repetitive behaviors. So they used the RBSR and they used the obsessive compulsive scale modified for PDD. Um, they did see improvement in repetitive behaviors in their lower dosing group, but not the higher dosing group. And they did not find differences in autism symptoms overall on the ADOS. And they did see some significant improvement in that repetitive behavior scale um, on the lower end of the dosing range. And no, no differences in adverse events. I'm just mentioning, I'm not necessarily advocating these things, but mentioning some of the other literature that's out there. So a lot of these studies that have been done in atypicals, primarily looking at irritability, have also measured stereotypy through the ABC subscale. And both the risperidone and aripiprazole trials did find a reduction in repetitive behaviors with these medications. It's not clear if that's because they were sedated or they had less levels of physical activity overall and that was reducing it. Um, and again, we have this risk-benefit profile, so you know, I, it's, it's hard to imagine many situations where you would want to use these medications unless they were physically damaging in some way and other things weren't working. Um, there was this um, Depakote study, it was a small RCT. They did show some improvement in their measure. And then a study of uh, decycloserine, um, not a large study, 21 kids. They did see s some decline in their stereotypy measure, but there was no placebo group, and their, um, s their baseline scores for repetitive behavior were, were pretty low. Okay, so here is our evidence. Um, so citalopram, we have one large RCT. It does not look effective. Uh, that's one, you know, our evidence level is, is uh, against use. Um, fluoxetine, we see some mixed results. Same for Luvox and then Buspar, also one large RCT that looked promising, but again, secondary outcome measures. So, um, I don't think that I changed our previous recommendations um, in looking at the guidelines. Um, there's really not sufficient evidence to recommend SSRIs specifically for repetitive behavior, but that doesn't mean there might not be individuals who might benefit in some case, of course. What I usually, um, in my practice, will say is and it's unlikely to change the repetitive behavior, but if it changes anxiety associated with these compulsions, then sometimes that's a reason to consider it.
Atypicals have to be weighed against their adverse event profile. You might consider it if those repetitive behaviors involve aggressive behavior or significant irritability. And then we want to really reserve medication for those cases where there's, who have the highest level of distress and impairment. 